announcements to remember our midweek service this week is not on Wednesday, it's on Tuesday. And so that'll give you a little bit of extra time. I know there's a lot of food preparation, travel, all that kind of stuff going on for Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving early. And uh, so that'll give you a little bit of extra time. So remember Tuesday, still going to be the same time, still 7 o'clock. Everything's going on just like it did before. King's Kids still happening. And um, anyway, so, but it's just going to be a day early. So make sure that you put a reminder on that. Because about Tuesday, about 7.30, you're going to start thinking, there was something I was supposed to do today. And uh, so that was it. Uh, next Sunday, we've got our Thanksgiving fellowship. And so this is going to be soup, salad, sandwich, fellowship. I figure by then you might be getting kind of tired of big meals and uh, turkey dressing, all that kind of stuff. If you just want to get rid of it, bring it. I'm sure we'll find somebody to eat it. And uh, But we'll do that next Sunday evening after the service. Notice the parking lot over there. Hey, Amen. It's coming right along. Man, they do a lot of damage in a hurry. And uh, so that's pretty fun. I always think that's one of the most rewarding jobs there has to be. I, I can't imagine anybody going home after that, you know, disgruntled. You know, I think you just get, get a chance to take it all out right there. And uh, so that was... They're, they're doing great. They're, they're looking, as far as timeline goes, of course, the dirt work's looking pretty good, and, and uh, they got culverts in. Uh, now it's just a matter of waiting on the cement guy who is pretty busy. They're looking at it. They said probably about the second week of December is whenever he should be able to break loose and be uh, able to there. So uh, so if you come next Sunday, it's not all the way done. That's why. So it'll take a little bit of time for the concrete guy. Uh, but continue to pray for those folks that are working over there. They'll be safe. Just doing a really good job. And... Got our nephews with us today. So glad they're able to be here too. So appreciate that. And I think that's all. So Brother Ethan, why don't you come give us devotion this morning and then open us in a word of prayer, please. Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 8. Yes. Luke 8. We'll be reading... Verses 45 through 46. I entitled my devotional, It's Not a What, It is a Who. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Luke 8, 8, 45 through 46 says, And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were, were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Here in Luke we find Jesus amongst a dense crowd when he stopped as a woman in need of healing, reached out and touched him intentionally. He noticed it because he felt the power go out of him to meet her need. From this we see the love and compassion of Jesus for one individual woman amongst the crowd of uh, amongst a, big, a great crowd due to her faith that if she touched him, her need would be met. This shows that you and I are not a part of uh, a huge mass of humanity, but unique individuals of his creation. He cares about what happens to us. Putting it into a bigger comparison, David marvels at God's love for us compared to an infinite universe. Psalm 8, 3 through 4 says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? On a more intricate level, he knows the very the number of he knows on the very okay more intricate level the very of your the very hairs of your head are all numbered as it is mentioned in Luke twelve six. Because of our human limitations in time and memory, we can't process the needs of billions of other people, nor can we do anything to meet more than a small percent of those needs. But God, in his infinite strength and wisdom, knows each one of us by names and cares for us. When we understand that we're a part of, or that we aren't a part of a crowd to God, but a singular individual he knows and loves, then can we serve most effectively and with full faith. To explain my title, it's not a what, but a who. We understand the lady needed healing, which is our what, but her obedience and putting her faith in who she knew, which was Jesus, and made her whole. It's a perfect example of faith in action. She knew he was almighty God and fully capable of fulfilling her need simply by touching his clothes. As Christians, we need to adopt this mindset for every aspect of our walk with Christ, fully trusting his power to meet every need. I will open us up in prayer. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity we're able to gather here and learn more about your word. I see you watch over Pastor Jim as he preaches it this morning. You give him the word you'd have him to say. He asks that you'd open our hearts to be able to receive it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Great devotion. All right, let's all stand together. Take your red hymn books. We're going to turn to page 210. 
210. This is your singing calisthenics for the day, ma'am. Page 210, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. <clears throat> Everybody take a deep breath now. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most divine. By His transforming power, making Him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Amen. Turn to 185. 185. My Savior's love. <clears throat> I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean in the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me he took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, oh how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. With the ransomed in glory, his face I 
at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, oh how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, oh how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. Amen. Great singing. Brother Jimmy, would you ask a blessing on our offering, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for the blood you shed and the life you gave on the cross, Lord, to pay our debt for our sins. We thank you, Lord, that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. We pray, Lord, as we hear the preaching of your word, Lord, you will help us to align our hearts with your word and with your will. Help us, Lord, to allow your word to work in us and through us, mold us and make us. We pray, Lord, your word will go forward with Clarity and authority, Lord, convict hearts, change lives, and call in the lost. We pray, Lord, your sweet spirit will be among us, and it will renew and refresh your spirit that lives within us. Yes, sir. We pray, Lord, that we will bring honor and glory to your name here today with the words we say and the songs that we sing. We pray, Lord, you'll take this off and bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated.
certainly have a worthy God. Amen. Let's take your red hymn books, turn over one time to 164, page 164. You can remain seated on this one. <clears throat> we sing, Praise Him, Praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. <clears throat> praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen. All right, let's turn over, stand together. Turn over to 439. 439, we're going to sing Count Your Blessings. <clears throat> After the first verse, the choir's going to come down. <clears throat> and kids will be dismissed for Children's Church. Want to go? 439. <clears throat> when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count too many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, Name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy, your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. 
Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Amen. Y'all can be seated. We've got one more congregational. And we're going to be at 215. 215. I thought about that just a moment ago. Told the kids to go ahead, head out. The kids are singing. So if you see any kids just wandering around back there, they're wondering where the crowd is. <clears throat> 215. Heaven came down, glory filled my soul. <clears throat> wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He met the need of my heart. Shout us dispelling with joy, I am telling, He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit, with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, who oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made. When as a sinner I came, took of the offer of grace, he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. All right, great singing. And we got the kids coming. <coughs>
me? Okay, well, you said I kept a few of these up here. Um, I just kind of sprung, sprung these things on these kiddos and on, uh, on Mike and Melissa, too. Um, so I'm thankful for them. But I just, we, my class has been working on um, some verses, and it kind of goes along with our, our uh, century challenge. So I just thought this would be a good time to share it. So our girls are going to do that. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear to my saints. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for how they are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the paths of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Uh, that's great. Amen. So thankful for that. All right, we're going to be in Daniel chapter number two this morning. If you'll find your place there, Daniel chapter number two. Daniel chapter 2, whenever you find your place this morning, if you're able, then let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. <clears throat> we're going to kind of break into the, the business end here where we're going to be, and then we'll lead into that a little bit as we go along here. Daniel chapter 2, and we'll start out in verse number 19. <clears throat> verse number 19. Yeah, there's amen. amen. It says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. And he says, I thank thee. And praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. I want to bring our message this morning of the truths of thankfulness. The truths of thankfulness. Father, we want to thank you once again for allowing us the opportunity and privilege, the pleasure, Lord, to be in your house today. And Lord, we don't want to take those uh, privileges uh, lightly at all. Lord, we know that uh, truly our nation is in your hand, and God, we need you to move in a mighty way. And I pray, Lord, we, we would seize every opportunity to draw close to you and your word and to be able to see the things that you have for us. Lord, I pray, God, that you would speak to every heart here today. Lord, we all come with different needs. It's a, uh, sometimes it's a, a trying time of year around the holidays, and I pray, God, that you would lift up each person. Help us, Lord, to uh, draw power and, and understanding from you, your word, your might. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. <clears throat> Think about what are the things that are going on in our nation. Man, what a time for Thanksgiving. Amen. <clears throat> the, the atmosphere of the year has been pretty toxic all around. I mean, and it, it started off rough and then it and then it got rougher. And uh, you know, it, it hadn't even reached the boiling point yet. I think as a nation, we're still just kind of percolating. I, I think we, we're still got uh, much more to come and, and all of that. And, and then we get to this time where we're supposed to be giving thanks. And there's a lot of states that say that families can't even do that. They can't get together with their family to be able to, to have a time of thanksgiving. It's okay if you've got a political rally. It's okay if it's a protest march. If your sports team wins, uh, it's okay to celebrate in the streets. But by all means, don't get around with your family and friends, loved ones, during the holiday season. Now, that's pretty rough because a lot of times people think of Thanksgiving as a family holiday. 
Amen? Uh, that's something that's pretty important. Everybody's got their traditions, and you've got uh, different things that you typically do Thanksgiving-wise. We have different things that we typically do. And, and we start thinking about what it means to be able to give thanks, and, and then the situations, and we start to wonder, you know, if this is a kind of a family holiday here, is it possible that we even give thanks with our family if we can't get together with the family? There's many people that are jobless this, this year. If you have no job, can you still give thanks? If you're protesting football, which you should, can you still give thanks? If you can't buy ammo without a small business loan. <laughs> I know. It's hunting season too, amen? Can you still give thanks? Maybe the best time in the world for us to rehearse some truths about Thanksgiving. That brings us up to Daniel. Daniel, here's a man. He's got, he's got no possessions. He's got no family here. Uh, there's been an attempt uh, to remove his identity, who he really is. And yet in verse number 23, he says, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my Father. Here he is. How in the world is he able to thank God when, when he's got nothing of himself? Everything has just been taken from him. How could he possibly give thanks? Let's build up to our text just a little bit here, see what's, what's been going on. Uh, it really starts around Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, all you FBIers, is the capital city of, everybody say Judah. Amen. So capital city of Judah. And after Solomon died, you remember the kingdom divided, split in half there. And, and uh, 10 of the 12 tribes went up north, formed Israel. And then uh, two of the tribes were on the south side and they formed Judah. And uh, the northern kingdom uh, was taken captive. We're, we're sh shooting right through the kings and everything. And, uh, but anyway, godless area. I uh, never really had any revivals to speak of. Uh, but they were uh, taken captive by Assyria. And even though that southern kingdom lasted longer because uh, it did have some godly kings that would come about every now and then, uh, they, they uh, fell as well and it fell to Babylon. So Jerusalem was the city uh, that had the temple of God which Solomon had built for God uh, Jerusalem, man, it was a major, uh, a major place in the hearts of the people. It's referred to as Zion. The word Zion, it means fortress. Uh, Jerusalem was the, it was the pride of the Jews. Man, that was the bragging rights that was there. But uh, God's people rebelled against God. Long story short, they rebelled against him, and the city of Jerusalem was besieged. Now, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the leader of the charge during that time. He wasn't king yet. Whenever they did their first, uh, first assault that came later, he's referred to as king because that's who he came to be. By the time we get to our text, then he is uh, the king of Babylon. But, uh, but he takes them out, and, and uh, in the, the first assault there was three different attacks that were there on Jerusalem. And the first assault there was uh, Daniel and his three friends were those that were taken captive among many others of those first of the three raids. So these were godly men. Uh, even in Jerusalem, which at the time Jerusalem was under Jehoiakim, and uh, he was not a godly king at all. And yet we see Daniel and his three friends, they were staying true to the things of God. And that didn't change whenever they were taken captive. Uh, even though they were captive, even though they were going into a foreign land. And you think about it, that's the time that a lot of times people just kind of drop their guard. They drop their convictions because nobody else is around. Everything's bad anyway. Might as well do whatever everybody else does. That wasn't Daniel. Uh, Daniel had made a purpose beforehand. We'll see that as we go through. But, but uh, he decided that he was going to stay true to God. So several of the Hebrews uh, were enlisted to become wise men there in, uh, in Babylon. And uh, some of the things that they did, that they, they would say they, uh, they would take those, and of course Babylon had their own wise men, which as we're going to see about them weren't too wise at all. And, uh, and obviously you can see why it is that they're wanting somebody else. I, I, think, I think King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to see, uh, I think he knows exactly what's going on. I think he's, he realized he's being duped. The people that are supposed to be wise aren't wise, and yet they're making a comfortable living off of him. And I think he's like, you know, we're just going to put this whole thing to the test, and we'll see that. But anyway, so he's going to get some of these Hebrews to be uh, some of the wise men uh, that are there, and among those, Daniel, and then there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and uh, those three Hebrews. And so uh, what they did was they began to uh, indoctrinate them a bit. They had to learn the language, the Babylonian language. And it wasn't like just us learning Spanish or something like that. Uh, the Babylonian language, which I'm out. You know, I'd be, I would not be the wise guy right there. You know, it's like, I'm done. And, uh, but anyway, it was like three different languages in one whenever you think about what was spoken in Babylon. So these guys were pretty much the cream of the crop. 
as far as their abilities and, and all of that. And so uh, they were try, uh, trying to teach them their language. They were trying to teach them their ways and all the things that were going on so that they were uh, culturally understanding and essentially try to brainwash them. They would give them new names. They said, well, this isn't your name anymore. This is going to be your Babylonian name. And it was just kind of taking away their identity. And, uh, you know, and it was one of the things that where he would just continue. They would break down the people whenever they were taking captive. It wasn't just, you know, we read it and they're like, yeah, he was a captive. Whenever they were captive, they would walk them from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon naked. It was a point of humiliating them. They were just torn apart from everything that they ever knew, completely removed, and, and, and uh, so and shamed and all of that. And then all of a sudden they get to Babylon and they said, here's a way that you can be accepted. And so a lot of the people were falling in with this indoctrination. And that was the life of Daniel. Uh, Daniel was a slave. Uh, he was from a, or he's in a heathen nation. Uh, he was from a background of people who had rebelled against God, and he was still standing for God through it all. So in chapter 2, you got Nebuchadnezzar. He's become the king, and he has this dream. Very important dream. Whenever we read this from a prophetic aspect, uh, man, there's a lot of prophecy in this dream, and, and it's not any uh, part of what we're studying today. Uh, but, but this dream, it goes through from that time all the way up to the second coming of Christ. That's what is entailed in the dream uh, that he has. And so uh, he has this dream. And the, the important thing that we see about it is the king's expectation. Uh, that is important in our subject of thinking about Thanksgiving. So Daniel is, is facing a time. He's got this impossible dictator. He's in a foreign land. He's captive. He's a slave. Lost everything that he ever knew outside of God. And uh, he's got this impossible dictator. Now look in chapter 2 and go down to verse number 5. It says, The king answered uh, and said to the Chaldeans, This is the wise men for the Babylonians. He says, The thing is gone from me. If, uh, uh, if you will not make known unto me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you should be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. So here it is. The king has this dream. It's plaguing him. He can't, he can't get it. And, and whether he knows or not, he's, I, think he's, I, I personally think he's just a pretty smart guy. Because he's, he's seeing that he's kind of getting railroaded by his wise men. Uh, you know, they're just kind of milking him and everything. He says, I got this dream, and I want to know what the interpretation of the dream is. And they're like, yeah, yeah, man, we'll, we'll tell you. No problem. Anybody can interpret a dream. We'll do it. He says, good. Tell me the dream, and then tell me the interpretation. And, and that's what he says. He says, you know, so they're, they're kind of going back and forth. They say, well, wait a minute. Tell us what the dream is. And he's like, no, no, no. If you're so smart, if you've got it, then you tell me the dream, and then you tell me what the dream means. That's throwing it out there. Right? Now, if you notice in verses 5 and 6, there was no middle ground. He says, if you can't do it, I'm going to cut you in pieces, and your houses will be made a dunghill. That's something that Jehu did. If you remember, if you're studying through, I think it's 2 Kings 10 uh, Jehu was going through, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the Baal worship house, the, the, the house for the Baal worship, uh, it says that he made it a draft house. That literally means a sewer house. That's what he did. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar says. He says, I'll make your homes uh, um, uh, outhouses. So that's what's, what's going to happen. He says, or if you get it right, I'm going to greatly reward you. No middle ground. Amen. It wasn't like, a, well, if it's pretty good, if, I get, if you get 7 out of 10 stars, I'll let you keep your job and everything. He says, you get it right and get rewarded. You get it wrong, you die. That's the, that's the ultimatum there. So, so pretty rough on that end. Now go down to verse number 10. So the Chaldeans, here's the wise men, they answered before the king and said, there's not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that ask uh, ask such things as uh, at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king required, and there is none other that can show, uh, show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. Now think of what they're doing. All right? So they said, look, man, that is insane. King, nobody, there is not a king. He's, you know, they can't even say all your friends are doing it. Hey, man. He said, listen, there is nobody that's requiring that of us. There is nobody that has ever asked any magician, wise man, astrologer to be able to do what it is that you just did. He said, only the gods would be able to answer that. And he said, and they don't live in flesh. You know, he said, we're the best chance you got. And we're telling you, we can't do it. That is impossible. Now, 
Right here, things go wrong. All right? Now, if you were one of the wise men right about then, you're thinking, that was a good argument. I mean, nobody else could do it. Nobody's required. Nobody's even hearing about it. Surely you'll change your mind. Uh-uh. No, no. He just kind of set him off just a little bit. So verse 12, it says, For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He says, oh, yeah? Let me tell you something. I'm going to kill every one of you. That was it. He didn't even give them time to think about it. Amen. So verse 13, it says, And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So an impossible dictator. Second thing we see here is there's this impending doom. I mean, now this has just gotten personal for Daniel. Daniel and his friends have been playing Monopoly. They're just having a great time learning the language, hanging out at the house. All of a sudden the decree comes and says, you're dead too. Amen. He said, you fall into this as well. He said, wait a minute, I didn't even go before the king. It was, this wasn't my battle. It wasn't my fight. Nobody even asked me. He said, doesn't matter. You're dying. And so, uh, so all of this is kind of thrust upon Daniel. Uh, and you think about this if you're Daniel. It's from out of town. Amen. He's just a passing through. He didn't ask to be there. Man, they, he's, just, he's just in this place and going through all of this. And, and there's a verdict that is against him. Nebuchadnezzar and all the rage made the judgment. He said, you're all under the sentence of death. You will all die. Daniel knows what it is that he's got to do. So he calls out to God. And notice what, uh, go down to verse number 14. So then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. So Arioch's the guy with the sword. He's the one saying, wise man, yep. You know, that's the guy. All right, so he talks to him here, verse 15. He says, He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? He said, What's the rush? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. What did he make known? He made known to Daniel. He says, You know what the wise men have been doing around here? You know, the wise men, man, they've had it too good for too long. They went before the king. They tried to tell the king that he was just off his nut. And the king said, I'm done with you guys. He explained it to him. He says, That's why it's happened so quick. He says, uh, he, the king was going to give them an opportunity, but, but now they, they shot themselves in the foot. It wasn't fun for them. And he said, this is what's going on. He explained it to him. Verse 16. He says, so, so then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he should give him time and that he should show the king the interpretation, or that he would show the king the interpretation. Then verse 17 says, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Who's that? That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with their new names that were given to them. Verse 18, it says that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning his, this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So what does he do? He goes to the king and he says, king, just give me a little time. That's what I need. Uh, he shares the burden with his companions in verse 17, verse number 18. He sought the very mercies of God. Now this is no, this is no light manner or matter for, for Daniel. Just think about it. He's thrown into the mix of a battle that wasn't really his, in a land that was not his. He's minding his own business. He's serving God the best that he knows how. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's taken captive. Now he's in jeopardy by some godless leader for something that he didn't even do. All these problems that are hidden, and that's where we get the application for this morning. Put yourself in the position. Could you be thankful? If that was your life, could you really give thanks? Could you be thankful in circumstances beyond your control? Could you be thankful if you were part of an unreasonable, overbearing government? Could you be thankful whenever your personal freedoms are being threatened? Could you be thankful whenever it's your life is on the line? There's one thing that Daniel was counting on, and it's the same thing that we still count on today. And it's the faithfulness of God. His faithfulness. Whenever Daniel went into the king and he asked for the time, notice what he said in verse number 16. He says that he would show the king the interpretation. He says, king, a little bit of time, man. He says, I will do it. He says, I will show you that. What was he doing? He's trusting God. And because of God's faithfulness to him personally, because God came through, that's where it is that we pick up in our text where Daniel says, I thank thee, O God. Oh, I'm so able to praise you because of your faithfulness. I'm going to give you just a few things on thankfulness, and then we'll head out. First thing, thankfulness is not spontaneous. Thankfulness is not spontaneous. 
You don't wake up one morning, all of a sudden you're the most thankful person that's ever been. Man, the times are hard. Daniel's thankful. I'm going to be thankful too. You know, it doesn't just hit. Well, all of a sudden that thankfulness just comes. Thankfulness is a prepared response that comes by the faith in the Word of God. That's how you begin to be uh, thankful. See, a lot of times without that, uh, then, then our thankfulness depends upon whether or not we're having a good day. If it's a good day, everything's paid, everything's good, uh, Christmas is coming, we're singing the songs, trees up, hey, we're thankful. But whenever something else happens, there's a downplay, things aren't going the way that you planned, how are you going to be thankful with that? Well, you have to get back and say it's not about the circumstances happening right now. It's all about the faithfulness of God. I've got faith in the Word of God. I know that the Word of God is still true. I know that the Word of God is still just. It's never been proved wrong. There's never been the first error found in the Word of God. And it's been true in my life. I know I can count on God. And even in the midst of hard times, I know I can still keep a thankful heart. Daniel, think about it. He had excelled academically. Man, he was sharp. No doubt. And his Hebrew friends too. But his thankfulness wasn't about his learning ability. Listen, if, if, he was, if, if his rejoicing came because he could memorize something, he could learn a language, he was smart, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end. It's going to end. There, it's not going to be something that's going to continue. He knew that everything that he had in his life came because of the very hand of of God. Now see what happens here in his preparation. Back in chapter 1, turn back there right quick. I want to show you a couple of good verses. Chapter 1 and verse number 8 it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel was not exempt from temptation. He was a godly young man, but that doesn't mean the temptation was just going to go away. And, and certainly that was going to come by those finest meats and drinks that came by the king's table. He had to prepare himself before time. Before the temptation ever hit. That's true for every single one of us. Uh, you can rest assured temptation is going to hit your life. There's going to be temptation in some form or fashion, probably many different ways. You've got to be determined beforehand that you're going to respond, that you're going to honor God in whatever it is that comes about. There has to be that understanding that says, you know what, God is true, He is, uh, he is just, His way is right, and I'm going to honor Him regardless of what it is that comes against me in that day. He's got to honor God. You know, you make that determination ahead of time. So Daniel, he's got convictions that were forged into him by the Word of God. He knew what the Word of God had to say. He knew who God was in his life, and he was going to stand for God. Can I tell you, thankful people are those that have gotten anchored in the Word of God to know that they can trust God in trying times. Say it again. Thankful people are those who are anchored in the Word of God. You want to be thankful? Get established in the Word of God. Get to the one that you can trust. Uh, those that don't know what God has to say, you know what happens? They get tossed about by every wind of doctrine. They get tossed about every time there's an emotional high and low. They're just thrown around. They don't have any kind of security that's there uh, because it's like whatever the world throws at them today is whether they're going to be high, low, or indifferent. They're going to be upended mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whenever they should be rooted and built up in Christ. You know, Paul spoke of that exact same thing to the Colossians. He was talking about what it meant to be rooted in Christ and how much that rootedness actually brings about a thankful heart. Colossians 2.7 he says, rooted and built up in Him, talking about in Christ, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. He says, man, I'm abounding with thanksgiving whenever I'm rooted and grounded in the Word of God that's been taught. Whenever I'm rooted and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist said, Psalm 16, verse number 8, he says, I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. I was talking about the, um, the lot next door. Man, that was fun to watch. But I was, I was thinking about that verse in Colossians 2, 7. And uh, the, they had a little excavator, small one. I mean, it could probably almost go through the door. I mean, it was just, it was a little bitty guy. But anyway, they would go out there and, and he would start to dig out on the side of the side of the tree. I was talking to the operator. And he said, yeah, it doesn't take much. He said, you just dig around. He said, you kind of get some of those roots out of the way, get the roots exposed, and then he'd just kind of raise the bucket up and put it up against the side of the tree and a little bit of pressure. Dig out away from the roots, put on a little bit of pressure, 100-foot pine tree. Whoa. Think about that. Man, it's gone through all the storms and all the weathering. It's been there for 50 years, whatever. Boy, just growing high on the hill. Everything's great. And all you do, just clear out a little dirt around the roots. That's it. 
And that's what Paul is saying. He says, listen, uh, we're to be rooted and, and grounded, rooted and built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how it is that you're going to be able to have, a, have security. And, and that's how it is that you're going to be able to give thanks. The more rooted you get in the Word of God, the more you're going to be abounding in thanksgiving. Why? Because you're established in the Lord, not in just your situations of the day. Daniel was purposed said he purposed in his heart back in chapter 1 verse number 8. Another great verse is chapter 1 verse number 21. Chapter number 21 says, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Not only was he purposed, but he continued. If you want to show the reality of thanksgiving, get into the Word of God and stay there. Man, get, get close to the Lord and stay there. The Lord illustrated it very well in Matthew chapter 7 with the two houses. Remember they had those two houses. One was built on the sand and one uh, was built on the rock. Uh, the difference of the structure came. Now think about this. It doesn't say, well, you know, there was this shoddy house that was built on the sand and then there was a nice brick house that was built. And it wasn't like that. It just said there was a house. I think they were both equally nice houses. I think they were both the same. The difference was in the foundation, in the substrate that was there and how it was it was built. But the difference in the structure came during the storm. That's whenever it made the difference. Whenever the storms came, the structure without that firm foundation, without that groundedness, without being rooted, oh boy, it just fell. That was it. And it says in verse 27 of Matthew 7, the great was the fall of it. The same thing plays out in Daniel's day. There were some wise men. They had no answer. Because they had no answer, they were about to die. And then there was Daniel. He was a real wise man who was rooted. He was built up in the Word of God. And at the end of it all, he was still able to give thanks. You know, the truth is there's going to be storms that hit us in all manner of life. There's always going to be things that are there. And the way that you're able to persevere in the midst of that is how well that you're actually grounded and established in the Word of God. Secondly, thankfulness is not by possessions. Thankfulness is not by possessions. Again, remember Daniel? Daniel was a slave. He was a, he was a captive. He had no possessions of his own. And it's nice to be able to have things, but, but even if he had possessions given to him, even if he had a house full of stuff, man, if he had the nicest clothes, the nicest robes, everything was the finest, the, the, the best food and the freezer, all of that, none of it would profit him any at all in the situation that he's in. They wouldn't say, all right, all the wise men are going to be put to death. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't realize you had a nice house. Ah, no, 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 you got nice clothes, we're not going to kill you. No, no, he said death upon all of them. It didn't matter. See, real thankfulness is not about what you have, but it's about who you know. Hey, Amen? I was thinking about that when Brother Ethan was talking his devotion this morning. I said, right on, Lord. Amen. It's not in the what, it's in the who. It's great. Look at what he says, verse 17. It says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah his companions, that they would desire the mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I love that. He didn't say, Oh man, we want everybody to be spared. He's like, We don't want to go down with you. Amen. So Daniel's got two things that helped him to be able to have a spirit of thanks. Two things. The first thing that he's got here is godly friends got godly friends. He's got somebody he can pray together with. Somebody that's going to have an interest in the most important thing that you will ever have in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. You need somebody to be able to pray together. You know, it's great to have people that you do things with. Amen? That's one of the things that you like. Uh, fishing, fishing people got fishing buddies. Amen. Hunting people got hunting buddies. Quilting people got quilting buddies. Woodworkers just say, get out of my stuff. Amen. <laughs> but there's, there's nobody like a prayer partner. Nobody like a prayer partner. Those are the people that you call on whenever there's an eternal need. Oh, man, to have somebody say, I need you to pray with me. I really need to be able to get an answer from God. Now, if you notice, uh, Daniel didn't have a lot of those people in his life. Amen. He didn't have tons of them. It wasn't like, all right, let's get the whole town together here. We're all going to have a prayer meeting. No, no, he had three he had three that he, that he pulled aside uh, that, that he knew had the same kind of heart. There are plenty more people that were captive, remember? Plenty more Hebrews. He could have gotten all the Hebrews together and says, all right, all us Hebrews got to get to... He didn't even do that. 
I would imagine whenever uh, he, he made that stand whenever they were trying to brainwash everybody and they said, all right, the finest food is at the king's table. All the king's wine, this is what you get. It's all for you. And, and Daniel says, <clears throat> I'd rather just eat pulse. I'd rather have a V8. Right about then, I would imagine a lot of the Hebrews looked at him and said, are you kidding me? Man, thanks a lot. Here we were, we were going to get, the, we already walked naked from, from Jerusalem to Babylon. We have been absolutely humiliated. Now we got the opportunity to sit at the king's table. Give me the steak. Daniel said, no, we ain't going to do that. Now we're going we're gonna to honor God. I'm sure there were a lot of people, even though they were Hebrews, even though maybe they walked together along the way, but he didn't call on all of them. But he had three that had the same heart for the things of God. He had three that says, oh, we need to get in the very presence of God. We need to spend this time and, and really know what it is that God wants. You know, there's plenty more people that you can often call on for a, for a need. You know, well, you know, lock the key in the car, whatever. Amen. A lot of things you can do. Whenever you come to a spiritual matter, oh, you've got to have God's people. It's so good to be able to have a godly friend say, I need prayer. I need God to, to intervene. Daniel had these three friends that were more interested in God. Now I want you to think about this because here it is. They come together, it's time to pray. Where are they? They're in Babylon. What does that mean? They don't have their temple. They can't go into the temple to pray. They can't go to a priest and say, hey, cast the, the Urim and the, the Thummim and let's, let's find out what God's going to do. Let's cast lots and all that kind of thing. No ceremony at all. What was it? It was just God's people with a united heart and an interest to know the will of the Almighty God. That's what it was. They're saying, God, show us the answer that you want us to know. That's it. And don't forget the other thing that Daniel had. It was God himself. He had godly friends, but he had God himself. And just think, Daniel was a slave, no possessions of any value, but God was his God. And that could never be taken away from him. That was the greatest thing he could ever have. Now, at this point in his life, there is nothing that he needed more than the personal ability to approach his God. Nothing would inspire more giving a thanks than that. Hebrews 13, 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Oh, our thankfulness, it's all about him. Our thankfulness comes because of the mercies of God in heaven. And that's what Daniel is seeking in verse number 18. Look down to verse number 19. It says, uh, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. The fellowship of God is greater than any physical possession you'll ever have. Anything that's going to show up under your tree at Christmas time pales in comparison to the very possession you have with God. Daniel says, blessed be the name of our God forever. To bless God simply means you're ascribing the glory that is due to His name. You're putting Him back in the right place. You're recognizing Him for, for who He is and what it is that He does. He says, let the name of God be praised for who He is in my life. Verse number 20, I love the confessions that he makes here. He says, you know, wisdom and might are all His. There is nothing that God doesn't know. Amen? Amen. Man, we are swamped by the unknowns. A lot of times we lose our Thanksgiving because we don't know something that's going to happen. Well, rest assured, there's going to be tons of stuff you don't know. But God does. Amen. You can get that Thanksgiving back whenever you start to realize, hey, wait a minute, God's got it under control. God's got it, man. He knows the situation. There's nothing that's outside of His ability to be able to remedy. Verse 21, He says He, he changes the time and the seasons. Man, isn't that something? I don't have a switch where I could say, we're going to stay in fall for the next eight months. You better enjoy it. Amen? Because it ain't going to last long. For a long spring, allergy season. Click. There's one I could just bypass. Man, spring would be off the chart. There would be no more spring if I had the switch. God's in control of that. Amen? He's, our earth does not operate by chance. Verse 21, he says, man, he's in, he's in control of the rulers. That's good for Daniel. Daniel would have appreciated that. A man that's been removed from his home under the authority of this, uh, this pagan king, he's still comforted to be able to know that, that God holds the hearts of the king in his hands just like the rivers of water. Just, boy, he can roll them around. Amen. He's got it. That's, by the way, that's good news for us today. Amen. Good for us to know. We don't get who we want in government. We think we're done wrong. It may be that God knows what we need. God's the one who puts people up. 
and takes people down. God's the one that's in control. He knows what's happening. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, our election this year is not about our own comfort. Maybe it's about God. Maybe it's He wants a revival for His people. I was on a great conference call this week with Clarence Sexton. He's a pastor in um, Tennessee. But he was making a, he made a statement that, that stuck out with me. He said, the American people, he said, really, we don't want revival. He said, Christians today, we don't want revival. He said, as you look at it as a whole, he said, there's not a desire for revival. And he said, because it's too inconvenient. That's very true. Oh, we get upset about things that are not convenient for us. I mean, it's hard for us to make it to church whenever the doors are open in the freedoms that we have. Amen. There's a lot of things that happen. Man, we're, we're not really desiring God. When was the last time we shared the gospel with somebody? Oh, whenever there's a desire for God, there's an interest in sharing the Word of God. The freedom that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. Man, what a great day that is. But overall, then that's true. But he went on to say, he said, before we're ever going to see a revival, we're going to have to have a great disruption so that God's people are no longer comfortable. And nobody wants that because we enjoy comfort. Amen. And yet, look around. Oh, I think there's a lot of discomfort about to happen. It's great. It's great. We're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to enjoy things that are uncomfortable. But will it accomplish the will of God? Will it get God's people to set Him back in the right position? It's a reminder, God's in control. Psalm 75, 6 and 70 says, For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Verse 21, he goes on and says, Man, he gives wisdom and knowledge. God is the one that is the master of every spiritual gift that you have, every ability that you have. He's the one that gives it. He's the one in control of it. He's the one that meters it out for you. He deserves all the glory for what any of us could do. There's a there's a quote that I had, and I don't remember where I got it. Um, I don't remember who said it, but I liked it. But it says, some men become proud and insolent because they ride a fine horse, wear a feather in their hat, or are dressed in a fine suit of clothes. Who does not see the folly of this? If there be any glory in such things, the glory belongs to the horse, the bird, and the tailor. I like that. You know, anything that God equips us to do, He's the one that gets the glory for it. He's the one in control of it. Verse number 22, he, he reveals the, the de- look at it real quick, he says, uh, He revealeth the, the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. You know, whenever Daniel received the understanding of that dream, he didn't boast to it about, uh, to all the other men. He goes, I got it. I got this. I'm the one. You got to tell him. I'm the, you tell him my name. It was, there was no boasting at all. <clears throat> Skip down just a little bit to verse 27. 27 says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magician, the soothsayers show unto the king. That's not a question. He said, they can't do it. Verse 28, he says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar. What shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and thy visions on thy head upon thy bed are these. Verse number 30, he says, But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes that uh, shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Any thanks that we give, it's, it's not because of what we have. It's because of who the Lord is, what it is that he does in our life. Jesus said, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He deserves all the glory. Everything that's there, it's all because of Christ. There is absolutely nothing we can boast of of ourselves for life, for eternity. Your salvation. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll never be able to brag about what it is that you did to be able to go to heaven. You know, in reality, we're all like Daniel. We're all like Daniel. Captive to an ungodly king until Jesus came. Jesus, the very Son of God, left the splendors of heaven, came to a sin-cursed earth born through a virgin's womb, lived a perfect sinless life, 
died on the cross at Calvary. He took every sin that you have ever committed, the things that, that uh, whenever the Bible tells us that all of sin comes short of the glory of God, there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, all the sins that remove the righteousness, he said, I'll take all of that upon myself. Whenever he died on the cross, he died for your unrighteousness. All the deeds, remember our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. He says, I'll take it all. I'll take all that sin. And because of that, whenever he died on the cross, he says, I'll impute, I'll give you my righteousness instead. He said, there was a great transaction that took place. I'll take the sin and I'll impute the righteousness. Remember, God's not looking for goodness. He's not looking for you to be a good person to be able to go to heaven. You'll never go to heaven being a good person. God's not looking for that. He's looking for righteousness, and you're not righteous because there's sin that's there. And Jesus said, I'll pay for the sin. I'll give you my righteousness. You go to heaven on my name, not your own. And whenever we, uh, whenever we receive him, well, we're receiving that gift of salvation. We're receiving the gift of his righteousness. It's saying, I'm a sinner. I cannot go on my own. There's nothing I can do on my own. My full dependence is all upon God. That's kind of what we see with Daniel. Daniel said, there is absolutely nothing I can do. I'm under the sentence of death. There's no way that I can get done what needs to be done, but I've got a God in heaven, and I know that He has the answer, and I know He'll give that answer whenever I call out to Him and receive that myself. He couldn't boast about it. Third thing, and we're done. Thankfulness is not about our timing. Thankfulness is not about our timing. Verse 23, He says, I thank thee. All right, so here it is. All that background, everything that's leading up, He's getting to the point. He's got the answer. And right uh, immediately, boy, he goes into thanksgiving. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast not, uh, now hast uh, made known unto us the king's matter. Verse 24 says, Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus unto him, uh, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Notice this. Daniel's given thanks before it's all over. Amen? He didn't wait for the whole thing to be done. He didn't go into Nebuchadnezzar, says, Here's the, here's the deal. He gets a clean slate. Everything's good. Oh, now I'll give him praise. Now I'll thank God for it. He says, No, no. I asked God. What did he ask him? He says, God, we need to know the answer. We need to know what's going on. God, I need to know the interpretation of the dream. God said, here you go. He didn't say, no, let me throw down something else. If the king lets me go, then I'll be thankful. No, he said, before it was all said and done, he was already given thanks. He was saying, God has been so faithful. He is so faithful. He is so true. Now, think about it. He's given thanks, and he still hasn't gone in before the king, the king of whom is not that stable. Amen? He could very easy, knowing this king, he could very easy just say, you know what, I don't even care anymore. Kill them all anyway. Could have very, and yet he was still giving thanks to God because God was still thankful to him, or faithful to him. You know, we don't have to wait until everything is back to normal, and it probably never will be. Get used to it. We don't have to wait for things to be normal in our category before we are thankful to God. We've got a king who is faithful and true. He's aware of our nation. He knows our needs we, that we have as individuals. I imagine here it is. Here's Daniel, slave boy from a nation that's fallen because of rebellion against God. He's in a, he's in a pagan land, and yet God still has an interest in his life. God still has gotten glory out of Daniel. Daniel had a lot to be thankful for. This week... I hope we get back to the truths of thankfulness. It's not based on who's in government. It's not based on how much you got, how much food you have, how much food you don't have, what kind of clothes that you got on your back, how, what kind of car that you got, whether it runs or whether it doesn't. Our thankfulness is all about the faithfulness of our God. Oh, God, God is so great. He is worthy of all our praise. Can I tell you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, He will save you today. You can come to him, do the exact same thing. You recognize, you know, I'm under the sentence of death because of sin. But Jesus died in my place, took my spot at the cross of Calvary. He did all the hard stuff and bridged that way so that we could get to God because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can receive him today as your Savior. Let's all stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the grace that you extend and for the blessings that you have for us. I thank you, Lord, for this account. And Daniel, I thank you, Lord, for reminding us of all the things that we have to be thankful for. 
Lord, if anybody, Daniel had the ability to be able to complain about his situation and the things that went on in life, and yet here he was. He was praising God. He was thankful for God's faithfulness. And Lord, we know that you never change. You're still faithful today, still faithful to meet the need of every person. So I pray, God, that as we began in prayer just a little while ago, that we all come with different needs. But Lord, we see that you are always the answer. So I pray, Lord, for every need that's here. Lord, I pray, God, that we would be submitted to you and your will. And Lord, that you would do a perfect work. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. We're going to sing page 270 this morning. 270, just as I am. You want to come and pray. I encourage you to do that. You need to be saved. You're not sure if you die today that you go to heaven. Why don't you come? I'll show you in the Word of God how you can make sure that you've got that gift. You've received it. You're on your way to heaven. 270, just as I am. <clears throat> Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb. Of God I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, Without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, rich is healing of the mind, yea, all I need. Of God I come, I come. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Choir, uh, we still got choir practice today, 515. Hope you'll be able to be back for that. <clears throat> and hope you'll be back this evening as we continue on our study in Second Timothy. Got a lot to be thankful for, amen. We have just got a great God. Uh, Brother Ty Willis, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? <laughs> 